Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaskar, I am Dr. Rema Devi, Professor and Head, Department of Anatomy from Pondicherry Institute of Medical Sciences. Today, the topic for discussion is arches of foot. So, before we go into the arches of foot, let us just look at a case scenario. Mr. X, a 21 year old male, well built and healthy went for recruitment in the army. After physical examination, he was rejected uh, as he was having flat feet. Now, what is flat foot deformity? What are the various arches in the foot? What structures maintain the medial longitudinal arch? The answers to these questions we will get to know as we go through today's class. So, specific learning objectives for the day is introduction to the arches, classification of arches, basic principles of the arch and its supports, a description on the medial longitudinal arch, lateral uh, uh, longitudinal arch, transverse arches and the applied anatomy pertaining to this. Coming on to the introduction, you know that the skeleton of the foot is segmented and arched both longitudinally and transversely with the concavity directed towards the plantar side. Now, let me repeat this. I am going for this. I have to hold like this and talk. So, before we go into the arches of foot, let me give you a small introduction to the skeleton of the foot. So, we have the tarsals and the metatarsals. Among the tarsals, we have the calcaneus, talus, cuboid, navicula, the three cuneiforms, medial, intermediate and lateral and the metatarsals from medial to lateral 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. These are the metatarsal bones and then we have the phalanges. The skeleton of the foot as you have seen is segmented made of multiple bones and arched both longitudinally and transversely with the concavity of the arch directed towards the plantar aspect. So, what are the basic functions of the arches? The arches, if the bone, let me repeat, what are the functions of the arches? If the bone was a single one and functioned as a single entity during walking, it would have been difficult to maintain its uh, the, uh, the differences which happen at different levels of ground. So, all this is taken care of by the arch in its formation. So, the arches help in walking on irregular surfaces, running, jumping by acting as a segmented lever because of its specific construction. Here, it helps in the propulsive action of the gastronemius and soleus and allows the uh, long flexors of the soles to act at the proximal part of the forefoot by, uh, while in setting in motion. At the same time, the lumbricals of the foot prevents the buckling of the toes once when they are acted upon by the long flexors of the foot. The arches designed in an elastic form 
acts as a pliable platform supporting the weight of the body and in proportional distribution of body weight. So, the body weight is equally taken up by both the foot. So, each of the foot shares or takes up half the body weight. So, looking at one of the foot, the body weight is transmitted vertically through the talus and di distributed again equally between the calcaneus on the posterior aspect and the front of the foot that is by the, by the metatarsals on the anterior aspect. Now, looking at the metatarsals, we find arches designed in an elastic form acts as a pliable platform supporting the body weight in proportional distribution of body weight. The body weight is equally taken up by both the feet. So, in other words, each of the foot bears half the body weight. This foot as a single foot when you take it up, the body weight is transmitted to the through the talar joints and again shared equally between the posterior part that is the calcaneus and by the anterior part that is by the metatarsal bones. Having taken up in the anterior aspect, the anterior bones, um, uh, the five metatarsal bones together have got six bearing points in the fact that the first metatarsal bone has got two sesamoid bones which take up which also take up the weight of the body. So, there are six um, points by which the anterior portion of the foot. So, the weight taken up by the metatarsals are at six bearing points with the first metatarsal taking up the weight at two points because of the, of the two sesamoid bones be bearing the weight. And so, there are six points by which the metatarsals take up the weight. So, in other words, the first metatarsal takes up double the weight than what is borne by the other metatarsals. This is very clearly evident by the bulky or the stouty nature of the first metatarsal. And the weight bearing other element is the calcaneus which is also large and strong. So, this ex, uh, demonstrates how the body is takes up the weight through the calcaneus and the first beta, metatarsal which bear more weight than the rest of the bones. The arch also functions as a shock absorber. It also protects the enclosed structures like the muscles, tendons, nerves and vessels. So, disruption of the arch can uh, lead on to pressure symptoms in any of these structures leading on to compression, pain and uh, associated anomalies. The arch is also dynamic and pliable. In other words, once when the arch is resting, when the foot is resting on the ground, it remains more or less collapsed with the whole foot touching the ground. Once when it takes off, the arch retains its contour, maintains the arch and functions. So, thereby it acts as a springboard and helps in the takeoff function of the foot. Coming on to the classification of arches, they are longitudinal and transverse. The longitudinal, there is the medial longitudinal arch and the lateral longitudinal arch transverse comprises of the anterior one which is complete and the posterior one which is incomplete or a semi arch. Talking about the components of the arch, it has bones, the ends which might be anterior or posterior or medial or lateral the summit of the arch which is the highest point of the arch. Then there are the pillars which support the arch which might be anterior or posterior or again medial and lateral and the main uh, joint which is responsible for maintaining the contour of the arch. This is very clearly evident 
the various uh, components as shown showing the arch form with the anterior and posterior uh, ends and the pillars the the summit of the arch which might be contributed by one of the bones forming the arch and the main joint which helps in maintaining the arch um, uh, function so the arch can be compared to a bridge whereby all these elements come into play similar to what we have in the bridge the arch also can be com uh, compared to have bony factors that is the shape of the bones which maintain the arch or in other words if you look at the bridge the composition of the arch the way it is built the tie beams or the bow strings that are the structures that will be holding the arch from end to end and then there are the intersegmental tires or the staples that we call it which will be holding the adjacent structures and this is a suspension um, elements that is in the form of slings or suspension factors which are the structures which hold the arch from above or support it from a lower level. Most of these structures the tie beams, staples and the suspension bridges are constituted by the various ligaments and muscles that form part of the foot and thereby support the arch in its formation and function in different ways. Coming on to the medial longitudinal arch that can be considered as a big arc of a small circle. I will tell it once again, I have to come this way. Coming on to the medial longitudinal arch, it can be considered as a big arc of a small circle. So, so by thereby you see that the height or the summit of the arch is elevated. The various bones forming the arch are calcaneum, talus, navicular, the three cuneiform bones and the medial three metatarsal bones. Coming on to the ends of the arch, the anterior end is formed by the heads of the three metatarsal bones. The posterior end is formed by the medial tubercle of the calcaneus and the summit that is the height of the arch is formed by the superior articular surface of the trochlea of the talus which is the keystone of this arch. Coming on to the pillars, at the anterior end, the pillar is long, oblique and weak formed by the talus, navicular, the cuneiforms and the metatarsal bones. The posterior uh, pillar of the arch is short, vertical and strong formed by the medial half of the calcaline bone. The main joint of this arch is talo calcaneo navicular joint. Coming on to the bony factors that maintain the medial longitudinal arch. It is the wedge shaped nature of the bones, so much so the pointed end or the narrow end of the bone lies towards the plantar side and the dorsal part of it is formed by the broad end of the bone. So, all this helps in maintaining or aligning the structure as such. The sustentaculum talli of the calcaneus, the reciprocal nature of the bones that is the navicular articulating with the talus and the navicular with the cuneiform and the keystone is basically the talar head. Basically you find that multiple bones are involved in the uh, medial longitudinal arch. So, resiliency is the main feature of this arch. Coming on to the intersegmental ties or the various structures that will hold the arch together, they are the spring ligament or plantar calcaneo navicular ligament, the tibialis posterior tendon as it passes down for its insertion or the various intraosseous ligaments that can connect the adjacent bones. So, we do have both dynamic and uh, passive support for the maintenance of this arch. 
coming on to the tie beams or the structures that will be holding it from the anterior to the posterior end, we have the medial aspect of the plantar aponeurosis and the various long muscles that are attached from end to end. For instance, abductor halysis, flexor halysis longus and brevis and flexor digitorum longus and brevis, the medial part of that. Coming on to the slings or the structures that will hold on to the or support the arch, we have the tibialis anterior and the upper fibers of the deltoid which has a sling effect from above and the tibialis posterior by virtue of its attachment to the um, bone and to the adjacent bones of the talus and the metatarsals has gives a sustentacular action or supports it from below. Coming on to the lateral longitudinal arch that is considered as a small arc of a large circle. So much so, the height of the arch is very less and it has a, I uh, will repeat it once again. Now coming on to the lateral longitudinal arch, it is to be considered as a small arc of a large circle. So much so, the summit or the height of the arch is very small. The bones forming the arch are the calcaneus, cuboid and the lateral two metatarsals that is the fourth and the fifth metatarsal bones. The ends, the anterior end of it is formed by the head of these two metatarsals that is the fourth and the fifth metatarsal whereas the posterior end is formed by the medial tubercle of the calcaneus. The summit of the arch is formed by the superior surface of the calcaneo, uh, no, I have to repeat this. The summit of the arch is formed by the uh, superior surface of the calcaneum where we have the subtalar joint. The main joint of this arch is the calcaneo cuboid arch. The pillars of the arch the anterior pillar like the medial longitudinal arch is again long oblique and weak formed by the cuboid bone and the metatarsal bones fourth and the fifth. The posterior pillar being formed of the calcaneus is vertical, short and strong. The bony factors that maintain the lateral arch is the calcaneal angle of the cuboid. This is a small triangular projection of bone in the inferior border of the cuboid uh, on the proximal articular surface of the cuboid that rests on the upper surface of the anterior articular uh, surface of the cuboid. Sorry, I, I have to repeat it. The structures maintaining the long, uh, lateral longitudinal arch, the bony factors include the calcaneal angle of cuboid which is a small triangular projection of bone found on the inferior surface of the cuboid on the proximal articular surface of the cuboid. This rests on the upper portion of the uh, this rests on the upper portion of the anterior articular surface of the calcaneum. The key, this gives a upward tilt to the long axis of the calcaneum and helps in the maintenance of the arch. The keystone is the cuboid bone over here and the intersegmental ties or the various structures that hold the uh, arch together are the long and short planta ligaments on the plantar aspect. The structures maintaining the lateral longitudinal arch, let us talk about the bony factors. The main factor is the calcaneal angle of the cuboid which is a small triangular piece of bone on the inferior border of the anterior articular surface of the cuboid and this rests on the upper part of the anterior articular surface of the calcaneum. 
this by and large gives an upward tilt to the long axis of the calcaneum and thereby helps in the maintenance of the lateral arch. The keystone to this arch is the cuboid bone and the intersegmental ties which holds the, the ends of the arch are the long and short plantar ligaments which are found on the plantar surface of the sole. Coming on to the tie beams or the structures holding the arch together, we have the plantar aponeurosis, the lateral half of it and the various muscles like abductor digiti minimi, the la lower lateral portion of the flexor digitorum longus and brevis and flexor digiti minimi muscles. The slings or the supports acting from above are the peroneus brevis and tertius muscles and the peroneus uh, longus by way of its attachment to the under surface gives a sustentacular action. So, looking at the lateral longitudinal arch, we realize that it has got lesser bones and joints to participate. So, rigidity becomes the main feature of the arch and the lateral arch flattens out at the hinge surface between the cuboid and the basis of the metatarsal. So much so that it bears the weight of the body before the medial arch acts. Now let us look at the transverse arches. The anterior arch is a complete one formed only by the heads of the metatarsals. So they touch the ground end to end. Whereas the posterior one is an incomplete one in the sense that it forms only half the arch and the arch becomes complete by the other half in the other foot. The, the, thereby it com, uh, becomes a complete dome. It is formed by the basis of the metatarsal bones, the cuboid and the cuneiforms. It is the lateral end that touches the ground. Looking at the various uh, factors that support the arch, let us look at the bony factors which is quite important. It is the wedge shaped uh, nature of the cuneiforms and uh, in relation to the me uh, middle three metatarsals that hold the transverse arch together. The tie beam is formed of the peroneus longus and tibialis posterior as it goes for the uh, insertion onto the plantar aspect of the foot. The sling action is exerted by the peroneus tertius and brevis muscles from the lateral aspect. Coming on to the intersegmental ties that holds the different um, aspects of the transverse arch, we have the various muscles and ligaments that are there that is the deep transverse metatarsal ligament, tibialis posterior and peroneus longus tendons, various plantar muscles at their origin, dorsal introsia and abductor halysis. So having seen the arches, let us look at what are the clinical aspects or what happens once when the arches do not function well. So, uh, flat foot or pest planus is the collapse of the longitudinal arch. This was what we had considered in, the, in our clinical scenario. So, what happens there? Multiple reasons for the collapse of the arch that is once when there is a rapid increase in body weight and improper distribution of the weight can lead on to a flattening or it can be a loss in the tone of the leg muscles which can happen due to prolonged standing or fatigue. All this can lead on to flattening of the arch. Same time you would have noticed that the newborns do have a flat foot. This is because of the subcutaneous fat deposition and they develop their foot or they develop their arch only once when they start walking 
when the muscles regain their tone having looked at the arches their formation the way they are supported and maintained let us look at what happens if this anatomy is disturbed or if there is a dysfunction to these arches one of the commonest anomalies that we come across is the flat foot or this was the same thing that we had in our clinical scenario what happens there here there is collapse of the longitudinal arches which can be due to various causes where there is when there is a rapid increase in body weight leading on to different distribution of the body weight the arch can collapse or when there is a loss of tone in the leg muscles due to prolonged standing or fatigue the arches can collapse we have seen that the new bones do have flat foot this is because of the subcutaneous deposit of fat and their muscles are not well developed so as they start walking the muscles get their tone and then by it is only by one year or so the arches start developing in the new bones it another condition is the hallux valgus where there is an addition let me repeat it another condition is the hallux valgus where the, there is adduction of the great toe towards the midline undue prominence of the medial part of the metatarsal head occurs there can be a coexisting uh, bunion or a bursa in the subcutaneous uh, tissue which adds on to the pain and discomfort in the foot yet another abnormality that we see is pescavus where unlike the flat foot this is the rubus where there is the exaggeration of the long arch the pla plantar flexion happens at the transverse tarsal joint so the anterior part of the foot drops much below the level of the posterior part so much so it is only the toes that touch the ground and you have the impression of the of a heel as well uh, the middle part of the foot doesn't touch or doesn't leave behind an impression it is another abnormality that we see is the the so called march fracture where there is a continuous strain of the neck of the intermediate metatarsals which leads on to decalcification and eventually leading on to pathological fracture at the neck this is very often seen in soldiers after a prolonged period of sedentary life when they start marching or walking fast there may be a fracture happening and that is why it is called as march fracture it another entity that we commonly see or very often one of the commonest anomalies that we come across is the club foot which is referred to as talipus equino varus there are different entities to that different variations and combinations are there talipus equinus is where the foot is plantar flexed so that only the tips of the toes touch the ground on movement it is something equivalent to a horse galloping ne next entity is the talipus calcaneus where the foot is dorsi flexed at the angle so that it is a calcaneus portion of the foot that touches the ground and the toes are upturned the third variety is the talipus varus like something like what we see where the foot is inverted and adducted at the subtalar and talocalcaneal joints the reverse of that is the talipus valgus where the foot is inverted and abducted so talipus equino varus may have combinations of any of this 
at different levels and there are various reasons attributed to this anomaly. The muscle growth fails to keep pace with the skeletal growth. So, there is a lot of disparity or there can be an imbalance in the growth of the different muscles or tendons leading on to shortening of various elements and producing disproportionate arches. Thank you.